destined for How it ends It's the fall Hello everyone, I am Dr. Ratika Patil from Sanchiti Institute for Orthopedics and Rehabilitation, College of Physiotherapy. I am a musculoskeletal physiotherapy student. I welcome you all to our new physio TV session about elbow joint complex biomechanics. So now today we are going to learn about elbow joint complex biomechanics. We'll start our session. So why elbow joint complex uh, biomechanics and not elbow joint biomechanics is because elbow joint involves humeroradial joint, humeroulnar joint, proximal radioulnar joint, and distal radioulnar joint. Uh, the structures that are involved in elbow joint is distal humerus and proximal radial and ulnar uh, bones. On distal humerus, we have capitulum. Above that, we have radial fossa. Uh, on the medial aspect, we have trochlea and above that, there is coronoid fossa. Posteriorly, above the trochlea, we have olecranon fossa, which is an articulating part. On radius and ulna, we have radial head, which articulates with your capitulum. And we have trochlear notch, which articulates with the trochlea of humerus. Posteriorly, we have olecranon process and anteriorly, we have coronoid process uh, just distally to your trochlear notch. And your radial head has a rim kind of a structure and also there is a deepened part. You can see in the image, there is radial uh, head covering the radial uh, fovea. It is taking a little time to proceed with the slide. Okay, so you have a uh,
<laughs> so now elbow complex includes four joints as i have discussed with you humero radial joint so humero radial joint is hinge pivot type uh, type of joint so the hinge joint comes into picture when there is flexion and extension and the pivot type of humero radial uh, humero radial joint comes in uh, the part where pronation and supination is happening. Humero ulnar joint is your modified hinge type of joint, and proximal radio ulnar joint and distal radio ulnar joint are actually the diarthrodial uniaxial jo uh, joints of the pivot type. Why pivot? Because uh, the radius pivots on the ulna uh, while performing pronation and supination. And then humero ulnar joint, as we have discussed, the trochlear notch actually connects with your trochlea. And in extension of elbow joint, the olecranon process, uh, that is a part of uh, your ulna, comes in contact with the olecranon fossa of humerus. And in maximal elbow flexion position, coronoid process of ulna comes in contact with coronoid process of humerus. Then in humero radial joint, as I have see, uh, we have seen that capitulum, and above that we have radial fossa. So when in elbow extension position, your head of the radius is in, is not in contact with your capitulum of humerus, but when you perform elbow flexion at maximum position. Uh, the radial head comes in contact with the capitulum and also uh, radial head comes in contact with radial fossa that is present on your humerus. Then we have proximal radial ulnar joint and distal radial ulnar joint. So proximal radial ulnar joint is made up of radial head. That radial head attaches to the radial notch and that radial notch is present on your ulna. So radial head attaching to the radial notch of ulna makes your proximal radio ulnar joint. And ulnar head attaching to the ulnar notch on radius makes your distal radio ulnar joint. So got it? Radial head attaches to the radial notch of ulna makes the proximal radio ulnar joint. And ulnar head attaches to the ulnar notch of radial part, that is radial styloid pa part, which makes up about your distal radio ulnar joint. And these two takes process in pronation and supination movement. Then we have a joint capsule. Joint capsule, uh, elbow joint capsule actually covers your humero radial joint humero ulnar joint and proximal radio ulnar joint. Distal radio ulnar joint is not a component of your elbow joint capsule. So we'll see the markings. Uh, proximally, radio, uh, your joint capsule involves capitulum radial fossa, trochlea and coronoid fossa of humerus. And distally, it covers your trochlea it covers the head of the radius and also the coronoid process of the ulna. Uh, posteriorly, it covers your trochlea, olecranon fossa, and also posteriorly, on posterior part, distally of radius and ulna, it covers the olecranon process uh, and head of the radius. Tip of the olecranon process is not a part of joint capsule. And uh, elbow joint capsule is actually weak anteriorly and posteriorly, while on laterally and medially, the capsule is reinforced by the collateral ligaments. As in knee joint also, as knee is also a hinge joint, it is reinforced on the lateral and medial side by the collateral ligaments. Uh, similar to that, our elbow joint is also reinforced by the collateral ligaments on lateral and medial side. Also, these el this elbow joint capsule, it has folds. These folds, when stretched, allow for full range of movement, a full range of elbow motion. The capsule becomes taut anteriorly in elbow extension position. So when you are performing elbow extension position, your anterior capsule is taut. And when you are performing elbow flexion position, the anterior uh, capsule is quite relaxed, quite in relaxed position. And in elbow flex position, so maximum of elbow flexed position, your posterior capsule is taut. And also your elbow joint capsule is maximally distended or it allows maximum space in elbow joint 70 to 80 degree of flexion and where uh, it has a chance of accumulating uh, the fluid, synovial fluid that is 20 to 25 to 30 milliliter of uh, fluid it can accommodate. 
then uh, ligaments of elbow joint so as we have discussed before that uh, your uh, ulnar aspect and the radial aspect is reinforced by medial collateral ligament and ulnar collateral ligament so on ulnar aspect we have medial or ulnar collateral ligament this actually is a primary stabilizer of elbow during valgus stresses so what is a valgus stress valgus stress when your radius and ulna moves away from your joint position, away from your body, it actually exerts a valgus stress on the medial aspect. Okay. And also, the, as medial collateral ligament is a primary stabilizer, we have radial head uh, and dynamic stabilizers of uh, valgus stress are flexor and the pronator muscle mass. So in flexor, we have flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum sublimis muscle and also pronator teres muscle. These three muscles actually provides dynamic stability to your valgus stresses. Okay, And we have parts of medial collateral ligament which actually uh, checks your valgus stresses in various range of motion. So we have anterior part of medial collateral ligament, we have posterior part of medial collateral ligament, and we also have transverse part of medial collateral ligament. We'll look for the attachments now. So anterior bundle or anterior part of medial collateral ligament. So the proximal attachment is anterior part of medial epicondyle. So it is very easy to remember the proximal attachments and the distal attachments as it starts from the humerus and it ends on the ulna because it is ulnar collateral ligament. Anterior part is uh, the proximal attachment is on the anterior part of medial epicondyle. The distal attachment on the medial part of the coronoid process of the ulna. Then we have posterior bundle or part of MCL, uh, which arises from the posterior part of medial epicondyle and it attaches on the medial margin of olecranon process or olecranon process of the ulna. Then we have transverse bundle or transverse part of medial collateral ligament, which the proximal attachment is on the olecranon process and it attaches on the coronoid process of ulna. Also, your transverse bundle or transverse part of medial collateral ligament is a part of anterior as it attaches to the anterior bundle of uh, medial collateral ligament. Uh, you can see figure number two, which is given the cadaveric specimen uh, of uh, ligaments. So you can observe the ligaments in that also. Now, uh, primary ligament is restraint of valgus stress from 20 degree of elbow flexion to 120 of, uh, degree of elbow flexion is given by your anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament. And as I have told you before, that your medial collateral ligament also has a dynamic stability uh, provided by your flexor carpi ulnaris muscle, pronator teres muscle and flexor digitorum sublimus muscle. So these three muscles along with your radial head gives support to your medial collateral ligament in preventing from valgus stress. So our anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament also has anterior band and posterior band. Anterior band of anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament is taught in extension position. And posterior band of anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament is taught in uh, flexion position. And our uh, anterior capsule and radial head actually provides stability, medial joint stability to elbow joint. But when the medial collateral ligament is cut or it is injured, it does not, uh, like anterior capsule and radial head does not provide that much of, stability, that, that much of medial joint stability. Then posterior bundle of medial collateral ligament. So posterior bundle of medial collateral ligament, it limits the elbow extension but plays a less significant role than anterior bundle in providing valgus stability for the elbow joint. So anterior bundle and posterior bundle, bundle both provides the valgus stability for the elbow joint, but your posterior bundle of medial collateral ligament as uh, according to its attachment, it actually limits your elbow extension movement and provides little uh, valgus stability compared to the anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament. And posterior bundle is taught only in flexion position. Uh, 
Also, posterior bundle of medial collateral ligament is also now recognized to be contracted in those with elbow contractures, limiting uh, the flexion movement. Then we have transverse bundle of medial collateral ligament. So, in a recent study, it has been revealed that direct insertion of transverse bundle of medial collateral ligament onto the uh, anterior bundle of medial collateral ligament, that may potentially play a role in elbow stability because it has a little bit of uh, role in uh, providing your medial joint stability. But according to its attachment on the anterior bundle, it does provide a little bit of uh, elbow stability. Then we have lateral collateral ligamentous complex. Lateral collateral ligament is on the radial aspect of your joint. So the parts of lateral collateral ligamentous complex is lateral collateral ligament or radial collateral ligament. We have lateral or ulnar collateral ligament as it attaches on the ulna. And we have annular ligament which is uh, covering your radial head and we have accessory lateral collateral ligament. So we'll see uh, the proximal and the distal attachment. You can also observe these ligaments in a diagram shown uh, right beside the table. So radial collateral ligament, the proximal attachment uh, is, it is a fan-shaped structure that extends from the inferior aspect of your lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It merges with your annular ligament. And ulnar collateral ligament, it originates from your lateral uh, epicondyle. It inserts on the proximal portion of the supinator crest of the ulna. So, though it is a part of lateral collateral ligament, it is complex. It is called as ulnar collateral ligament. This is different than your medial collateral ligament. It attaches on the ulna. So, the name suggests that lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Then we have annular ligament. Annular ligament, it arises from anterior and posterior margins of the radial notch on the ulna. Uh, I had shown you uh, one diagram where your ulna, radial notch of the ulna and your radial uh, head binds together. So, it makes your proximal radio ulna joint. So, uh, this ligament, this annular ligament actually covers your radial head. Can you observe the, this in uh, the image given below? That it arises from the anterior and posterior margins of the radial notch of the ulna and it encircles the radial. Also, capsule and part of the trochlea and radial neck. Accessory la lateral collateral ligament, the proximal attachment of it uh, is on the annular ligament and it, the distal attachment is on the supinator crest of the ulna. So these all provides your varus stability or lateral stability of the elbow joint. So the lateral collateral uh, ligament provides reinforcement for the humororadial articulation. Medial collateral ligament uh, provides uh, stability to your humoro ulna. And uh, lateral collateral ligament complex provides reinforcement for the humororadial uh, articulation. It offers protection against virus st uh, stresses in extension. So the anterior part offers protection against virus stresses in extension movement. And the posterior part offers protection against the virus stresses in flexion position. Virus, when your radius and ulna moves towards your joint, giving a virus stress. Also, it assists in providing resistance to longitudinal distraction of the joint surfaces. As you have seen, the lateral collateral uh, ligament is complex. It actually covers your annular uh, ligament. It actually covers your accessory lateral collateral ligament. So it is actually bind to your radial head. So when the longitudinal distraction forces are produced on your radius, it actually gives... Uh, support to your joint. It also is a key structure that is always disrupted in elbow dislocations because it provides you maximal stability and when it is uh, disrupted, uh, you have elbow dislocations. Uh, lateral collateral ligament is complex is a primary restraint against force virus and supination stresses and also it provides the stability against forced valgus stresses. Lateral ulnar collateral ligament and annular ligament are secondary restraint against forced valgus and supination stresses and forced valgus stresses. 
also the posterior lateral stability of the elbow joint it uh, is given by lateral collateral uh, ligamentous complex but lateral ulnar collateral ligament is not a major restraint but it contributes to your posterior lateral stability by securing your ulna to the humerus also it might provide or it may provide support to your annular ligament because annular ligament is actually attaches on your radial notch of ulna huh? We'll look for the annular ligament. We have seen the attachment. So it functions primarily as a sling or acting as a barrier to slippage of the radius. So when your uh, hand is pulled, so there is distraction forces resulting from your humerus and radial head. So there is a distraction force and your annular ligament actually gives barrier to that slippage. Annual, annular ligament binds the radius to the ulna serving as an effective check to the lateral subluxation. So uh, proximal radial ulna joint, your radial head is attached to the radial notch on the ulna and your annular ligament actually binds your radial head, which is effective in checking the lateral subluxation. Also, it provides primary protection against distal subluxation or dislocation of the superior radial nerve joint is nothing but your proximal radial nerve joint. And anterior uh, insertion of your annular ligament is taught during supination movement. And in pronation movement, the posterior insertion of the annular ligament is taught. Then we have a very important part that is introsious membrane. So the introsious membrane, can you see this arrow part? And uh, you can see a septum type of structure in a diagram between your ulna and the radius. That is actually your introsious membrane. Introsious membrane attaches to the length of the medial surface of the shaft of the radius. And it passes medially and distally to the introsious border of the ulna. So it is nothing but it is a connecting structure between your radius and ulna. So what is the function of this introsious membrane? So it binds the radius and ulna together throughout your length of the forearm. Also the main function of introsious membrane is it distributes your load from radius and ulna. Also it helps shun some of the muscular produced compression forced from the radius to the ulna. So in uh, actually in wrist joint, the first, when your hand is in weight bearing position, the first force that travels uh, through the wrist joint is from the uh, radial. So radial uh, radius is in contact with your carpal bones. And that force when travel, it can directly reach up to your humerus from the radial head and capitulum. But this introsious membrane actually helps to divide that force to the ulna. So uh, the force is passed through your radial styloid process uh, and through introsious membrane, it actually divides into the radius and ulna. Uh, approximately the weight that is carried by radius is 68% and 32% by the ulna. Uh, that is divided by the introsious membrane. And then it can travel up to your capitulum and trochlea of the humerus. So this is a very important structure of your then we'll learn about the axis of motion for elbow joint flexion and extension. So the axis of uh, motion for the elbow joint and flexion, it is uh, actually oblique in direction. It passes through the capitulum and trochlea of the humerus. So uh, there is actually a variation found in the instantaneous axis inclination support. Uh, and that is because of the activity of various muscles uh, that can influence their pattern of motion during elbow flexion and there is difference in contour of the joint surfaces and that can also provide uh, variability in your axis of motion. So can you see uh, this is your trochlea part. So trochlea on the medial aspect of the humerus. Uh, the medial aspect of the trochlea is actually uh, placed distally and anteriorly from the lateral part of the trochlea and also the capitulum. So this anteriorly displaced part of the trochlea, it actually uh, gives um, inclination of the axis for flexion and uh, extension. It is increased due to that.
then uh, it uh, one of the most important concept of elbow joint that is carrying angle and cubitis valgus angus so what is this angle so when uh, a line is passed through a uh, long axis of the humerus and a line is passed through your uh, ulna uh, it actually makes an angle on the medial aspect and that is actually a cubitus valgus angus so the medial aspect of the trochlea why uh, there is a cubitus valgus angle so the medial aspect of the trochlea extends more distally than does the lateral aspect of the trochlea, which shifts the medial aspect of the ulnar uh, trochlear notch more distally. And it results in lateral deviation of the ulna in relation to your humerus. So lateral deviation is nothing but your ulna is slightly placed away from your body and that gives your valgus angulation. The normal valgus angulation, it is called as carrying angle or cubital valgus angle. And the normal angle, it varies between 8 degree to 15 degree of range of motion. Excessive cubitus valgus angle. So, when this angle is more than 30 degree of uh, range, uh, more than 30 degrees of deviation, we can call it as excessive cubitus valgus angle. And when uh, the angle is uh, deviated medially, and uh, it is deviated 5 degree medially, we can call it as cubitus varus angle. Actually, carrying angle, uh, we can observe carrying angle in elbow extension position. As we have elbow flexion, uh, as the elbow flexes, the carrying angle or the cubitus valgus position diminishes. Then we'll come to the kinetics and kinematics of elbow joint. So, we have flexion and extension movement happening at elbow joint. So, how humero ulnar joint and humero radial ulnar joint, uh, humero radial joint takes part in this. So, the active range of elbow joint, uh, according to the literature, is it is given at 0 degree to 145 degree, and passive range is 1, uh, 0 degree to 150 degree or 160 degree. So, why there is difference between these ranges is because you have uh, your muscular component or your soft tissue bulk or muscle bulk over anterior aspect of the humerus, that is nothing but the biceps brachialis and the coracal brachialis muscle. So, when you uh, press your elbow into maximum of flexion position, and that is the passive range of elbow uh, flexion position, that's why there is a difference between the active range and the passive range of elbow joint. There is nothing but the soft tissue that is uh, felt between your uh, ulnar and the radius and the humerus. Arthrokinematics of humeral ulnar joint, so concave trochlear notch rolls and slide on the convex trochlea. Uh, we all know the concave convex rule. So, when the concave surface, uh, concave bony part moves on the convex part, it rolls and slides in the similar direction to, the, your, to your movement. So, you can observe uh, that in the left side image that your trochlear notch is nothing but your concave surface, your trochlea uh, is a convex surface. So, when your flexion is happening, the trochlea notch trochlear notch rolling and sliding in the on the convex part so in elbow extension position your anterior capsule flexors are in taut position and your posterior capsule and extensor muscles are in relaxed position and in elbow flexion position as the trochlear notch is sliding we have Flexors and anterior capsule, as you can see, the uh, coiled structures they have mentioned in the diagram. So, these are nothing but the relaxed structures. And in uh, elbow flexion position, your posterior capsule and extensor muscles are maximally in taut position. In elbow extension, uh, the reverse happens. In humeroradial joint, so fovea of the radius rolls and slide across the convexity of the capitulum. So, your capitulum of the humerus is con convex part and your radial fovea, not the radial head, the fovea of your radius is your concave part. And in flexion position, similar to the uh, flexion position, uh, it is anterior capsule and your flexors are uh, in relatively relaxed position. Then kinetics of elbow, uh, elbow flexion. So, which are the muscles that helps in elbow flexion? The primary flexors are, are biceps brachii muscle, brachialis muscle, 
ब्रेक्योरेडियालिस्पासम एंड द सेकेंडरी फ्लेक्सर्स आर प्रोनेटल टीरी स्पामेरिस लॉन्गस फ्लेक्सर डिजिटोरम सुपरफिशियलिस फ्लेक्सर कार्पी अल्नारिस एंड फ्लेक्सर कार्पी रेडियालिस्पासम सो दिस ऑल मसल कर इस फ्लेक्सर डिजिटोरम सुपरफिशियलिस स्पामेरिस लॉन्गस फ्लेक्सर कार्पी अल्नारिस एंड फ्लेक्सर कार्पी रेडियालिस्पासम इट एक्चुअली ओरिजिनेट्स फ्रॉम योर मीडियल एपिकोंडाइल एंड इट गिव्स सपोर्ट इन फ्लेक्सन पोजिशन बट दे आर प्राइमरी the rich flexors and long flexors of uh, the forearm then we have biceps muscle so muscle action of biceps muscle you can see uh, the attachment of biceps we have long head of the biceps and the short head of the biceps the action uh, which biceps does is elbow flexion elbow supination and also uh, does shoulder flexion shoulder abduction and it stabilizes the glenohumeral joint because the biceps uh, actually provides movement to your shoulder so your uh, biceps activity depends upon your shoulder position also so it has a largest volume among the flexor but it has a relatively small physiological cross sectional area across the elbow joint uh, can you see in the diagram that on the elbow part uh, actually the biceps tendon are coming it attaches on the radial tuberosity and radial aponeurosis and uh, so there is a very small physiological cross sectional area that is uh, that is on the elbow joint also movement arm of the biceps is largest between 80 degree to 100 degree of elbow flexion therefore in this range that is this 80 degree to 100 degree of elbow flexion as the movement arm is largest the biceps is uh, able to produce greatest torque in this range as i have told you before the functioning of the biceps is affected by the position of the shoulder because both head of the muscles cross both the shoulder and the elbow joint so biceps brachii is active during unresisted elbow flexion with the forearm supination position when the for forearm is midway between supination and uh, pronation position and the biceps is active but a very less activity of biceps is seen when the forearm is in pronated position so uh, whenever we are performing the uh, manual muscle testing we uh, choose the biceps uh, activity to be uh, graded in uh, elbow supinated position because it is a elbow flexor and supinator however when the magnitude of resistance increases much beyond the limb weight the biceps biceps is active in all of the forearm positions uh, you can see how the movement arm of the biceps is varying from 85 degree to 100 degree and it is able to sorry uh, it is able to provide greatest torque in this range uh, and when the the elbow is in extension position so uh, elbow extension position the movement arm of the biceps is relatively uh, small so in elbow extension position the biceps actually works towards compression of the joint hmm? so when it is contracted in elbow extension position the compression of uh, your elbow joint occurs and when it crosses your 100 degree of uh, elbow flexion so your uh, uh, your parallel forces is converted into your perpendicular forces and actually in this uh, it helps in joint distraction of the elbow then we have other muscles that is brachialis brachioradialis and pronator teres muscle so physiological cross sectional area of brachialis is large and it has a large working capacity uh in the elbow joint because it is a one joint muscle it is not a two joint muscle as uh, biceps is uh, movement arm of the brachialis muscle is greatest at 100 degree of elbow flexion and it is unaffected by any forearm position so in any of the forearm position the brachialis is maximally active as the uh, brachialis is active in all position of the elbow joint it is called as a workhorse of the elbow flexors then we have brachioradialis joint so the physiological cross sectional area of the brachioradialis joint is very small okay. uh, then it has a large average peak movement arm between 100 degree of elbow flexion to 120 degree of elbow flexion it shows moderate activity in mid prone position so while performing manual muscle, uh, muscle testing uh, of brachioradialis we keep the elbow uh, in mid prone position okay. 
So uh, the activity of brachioradial is, is it acts as a pronator in supination and supinator in pronation. So what does it mean by this is when uh, your arm is in supination position, brachioradialis acts actually as a pronator. So pronator activity of brachioradialis brings your forearm from supinated position to a pronation position till the mid prone position. And when your uh, arm, forearm is in pronation position, brachialis acts as a supinator muscle. So it acts as a supinator and it convert, it turns uh, the forearm from pronation to supination position. Pronator teres is actually uh, also as a elbow flexor, but it uh, helps maximally in pronation activity and it is a weak elbow flexor position. Kinetics of elbow extension. So, elbow extension, the primary extensors are triceps brachii muscle and anconius muscle. Uh, as our biceps uh, covers shoulder joint and elbow joint, triceps brachii is also uh, covers like it has action on your shoulder and elbow. So, shoulder position affects the triceps activity. And anconius. Anconius is compared with the triceps muscle. The anconius has a relatively small cross-sectional area and small movement arm uh, for extension. It provides longitudinal and medial lateral stability across the humeroulnar joint because it covers the humeroulnar joint. And this stability is beneficial during extension activity. And this stability is also beneficial during active pronation and supination. Uh, there is a one concept called as law of parsimony. So what is law of parsimony is nothing but it states that the nervous system tends to activate the fewest muscle or muscle fibers possible for the control of a given joint action. So there uh, exists a hierarchical recruitment pattern of muscle fibers. So when the elbow extension is happening, anconius first comes into uh, picture, then medial head of the triceps comes uh, into picture and medial head of the triceps is also called as a workhorse or elbow extension because medial and lateral head of the triceps, it arises from the humerus. It does not arise, it does not have an attachment above your shoulder joint. And then lateral head comes into picture and then uh, long head of the biceps actually helps in extension. Then we have pronation and supination rate of motion. So osteokinematics is pronation is actually 0 to 75 degree of flexion given in maximum of literature and supination is 0 degree to 85 degree of range of motion. Then axis of uh, pronation and supination, it is a longitudinal axis extending from the center of the radial head to the center of the ulnar head. It also runs obliquely then in uh, maximum uh, activities of daily living, we use supination and pronation activities. And supination and pronation, so in uh, in daily activities, maximum of 50 degree of pronation is required and maximum of 50 degree of supination is required for our daily tasks. Uh, on the right hand side, we can see uh, the daily task given and the range that is uh, required. So it is from maximum 50 degree of supination to 50 degree of pronation. Uh, maximum of range of motion is used when using fork, when doing a picture activity or uh, using a telephone. Then supination. So what happens in supination? So supination takes place on both the proximal radial nerve joint and distal radial nerve joint. So we'll first see the distal radial nerve joint. So when the supination is happening, your radius, so, mm -hmm. and there is a lung. So radial uh, notch. When supination and pronation is happening, your ulna is stable and your radius actually moves on your ulna. So it rolls and slides in the same direction on a fixed ulna. And in proximal radial ulna joint, can you see this radial notch of fixed ulna and the radial head? So radial head actually pivots. 
then we have pronation in pronation uh, on a fixed ulna radius slides and rolls in uh, posterior direction on distal radio ulna uh, joint and your uh, radius rotates on your radial notch you can observe this in a diagram given below that there is a fixed ulna and there is a radial notch and uh, radius actually pivots, radius actually rotates uh, on the radial notch. Then this is nothing but your pronatus teres action. So your pronatus prone, uh, teres, it starts from your medial epicondyle and it covers your uh, radius. And uh, when the pronator teres action is happening, so when your pronator teres is actually contracting, it acts it brings about the pronation movement. It is a primary pronator, uh, primary pronator muscle. Primary uh, action is provided by your pronator teres muscle. And while giving this pronation action, it actually gives spin to your radius. As I have discussed below, uh, before, that uh, your radius head actually spins around your capitula. And this pronator teres contraction uh, also gives compression to your uh, radio humeroradial joint as humeroradial joint is also a part of so this compression provided at the proximal uh, radial nerve joint and humeroradial uh, radial joint makes contribution to pronation and the activity actually differs in weight bearing of your hand and non weight bearing position of the hand so in weight bearing position of the hand your radius and hand is actually fixed to one part. Okay? So at proximal radio ulna joint, annular ligament and radial notch of ulna rotates around a fixed radial head. We have seen in non-weight bearing position, radial head is rotating. That is, radius is rotating. But in weight bearing position, your annular ligament and radial notch of ulna is rotating around your fixed radius. Okay? And in distal radial nerve joint, convex ulnar head rolls and slides in opposite direction because now the convex part is moving on a concave part. So it will roll and slide in opposite direction on ulnar notch of the radius. And in non weight bearing position, as I, uh, we have discussed, radius and hand is free to rotate. So radial in proximal radial ulnar joint, radial head rotates within the ring formed by the ulnar, annular ligament and the radial notch of ulna. And uh, at distal radial ulnar joint, concavity of the ulnar notch of the radius rolls and slides in similar direction on the convex ulna head because in this, the concave surface is moving on the convex surface. Also, you can observe uh, the diagram given above. So when there, uh, when your hand is in a weight bearing position, when the external rotation is happening, external rotation is bring about by the infraspinatus muscle, the supraspinatus muscle. Uh, that time, your arm is going into pronation movement. So when the twisting of your radius happens on your ulna, there is pronation movements. And when you are performing internal rotation movements, so this coiling of radius and ulna is corrected and uh, radius and ulna comes into a parallel position. So when internal rotation happening in weight bearing position, we have supination happening at your forearm. Then, uh, function of the supinator and pronator muscle this is nothing but a picture of pronator muscles. So, uh, in the first diagram that you can see, biceps, uh, it acts as the elbow flexor and supinator, we have supinator. Also, we have extensor pollicis longus and extensor indices muscle, which also helps in uh, supination action. Then, we have pronation. The primary prona uh, pronators are pronator teres and pronator quadratus muscle. Pronator teres muscle, is uh, covering your proximal radial nerve joint and pronator quadratus muscle actually covers uh, your distal radial nerve joint. So it actually uh, gives uh, movement to your distal radial nerve joint and it also gives uh, compression between your distal radial nerve joint. And flexor carpi radialis muscle is actually, uh, it also helps in pronation action. 
then kinetics of supination we have discussed this that is primary supinator muscle is supinator and biceps brachii muscle then we have secondary supinator muscles that are radial wrist extensors extensor pollicis longus extensor indices and brachioradialis. We have discussed that from a pronated position, brachioradialis acts as a supinator muscle, but it is a secondary supinator muscle. Then, what is the difference between supinator versus biceps brachii? Uh, so, a superficial set of fibers arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the radial collateral and annular collateral ligament. And a deeper set of fibers of the supinator muscle, those arises from the ulna near along the supinator crest and it attaches distally along the proximal one third of the radius. So, uh, when supinator muscle is acting, it generates a significant EMG activity during forearm supination. Regardless of your elbow, angle, speed or power, your supinator muscle gives maximum activity in forearm supination. Biceps muscle is also a primary supinator muscle, but your biceps is normally recruited during your high power supination activities especially those uh, which are associated with your elbow flexion activity because your biceps is a strong elbow flexor. And when your biceps is in a flexed position, it can work uh, in a good fashion uh, to provide your supination action. Then nervous system usually recruits the supinator muscle for low power tasks that require the supination motion only. And while the biceps is re uh, relatively inactive in this position. We have seen a law of parsimony, hierarchy of recruiting the muscle. So your supinator muscle uh, is recruited in low power tasks. And when there is a high power task, which is uh, which also involves your elbow flexion activities, biceps comes into picture. So effectiveness of the biceps of the supinator is greatest when the elbow is flexed to 90 degree. For this reason, elbow is naturally held in about 90 degree of flexion when you are doing high powered supination tasks. Uh, let's say example as a drilling or you are uh, opening a knob, opening a jar of a bottle. So that time your biceps is held in 90 degree of position when you are performing a good supinator action, when you require maximum force for your supination action. Huh? We can observe in this diagram also. So when your elbow is flexed at 90 degree, can you see this torque generation by the biceps muscle? So it is 500 Newton centimeter. So 500 Newton centimeter of torque is generated when your biceps is held in elbow or biceps is held in, your elbow is held in 90 degree of position. And when your elbow is flexed to 30 degree of position, the vector actually gives rise to two parts and uh, your torque generated is 250 Newton per centimeter. So what is best is elbow when flexed to 90 degree or more, it acts, your uh, biceps can act as a good supinator. Also in this diagram, can you see when your biceps is acting as an elbow flexor and supinator muscle, the uh, stability is actually provided. So when the vigorous contraction of biceps and supinator is acting, the stability is actually provided by your triceps muscle. So triceps actually neutralizes the strong elbow flexion ac action of the biceps. Mm -hmm. If biceps will act strongly constant, uh, in a st concentric manner, when performing supination, your elbow flexion will also occur. But this activity is actually neutralized by your triceps action. Triceps uh, acts isometrically to neutralize your biceps action because biceps is your elbow flexure and triceps is your elbow extensor. So they neutralize their action. Kinetics of pronation. We have seen uh, primary pronator muscles are pronator teres muscle and pronator quadratus muscle. Then secondary pronator muscles are flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus and brachioradialis. Brachioradialis from a supinated position, brachioradialis acts as a pronator. So pronator teres is actually involved in high intensity activities and pronator quadratus is involved in all pronation activities regardless of power. So, be it a low power activity, be it a high power, high speed activity, your pronator quadrat is uh, always working for your pronation action. Hmm? 
then uh, in pranid, uh, so pranidal quadratus muscle it actually covers your distal radial nerve joint can you see when the pranidal quadratus muscle uh, activity is performed or when it is uh, contracted your radius moves on the ulna relatively flex, uh, fixed ulna uh, radius slides and rolls and uh, also it compresses it gives stability to your distal radial nerve joint so with this, we summarize our elbow uh, joint complex biomechanics. So it is a modified hinge type of joint. Uh, it uh, involves your humero ulnar joint, humero radial joint, proximal radio ulnar joint, and distal radio ulnar joint. Movement performed by your elbow joint are uh, elbow flexion, extension, pronation, and supination. But why, uh, why is elbow so important uh, in our life or in our body? Is because it is is a connecting link between your shoulder and breast. Elbow actually helps you to reach to different objects, pick up objects, um, and also elbow is very important in eating action. So supination and elbow flexion activity is very important in eating action. Also, uh, reaching activities of arm is done by your elbow. So when elbow is in extension position, you can reach up to your uh, objects. And grasping is done by uh, wrist flexors. So you can see the references for your future, uh, future ref references and future studies. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much all for giving me a chance to be here and uh, present you with elbow joint uh, complex biomechanics. I hope you all uh, enjoyed learning with me. Uh, and uh, thank you so much uh, to our uh, principal, Apurva Shimpi sir, our chairman, uh, Dr. Parak Sanchiti sir, and Manisha Sangvi man for giving me this opportunity and uh, looking forward to have a next session with you all. Thank you, sir.